Coleman, it's lovely to see you here. Um, of course, we're here to talk about the Scots for Boys, but it's your first time in London and you've already done one show. So it's kind of two back for back for you. What's that been like? It's been it, it's been a whirlwind. It's been great. I was just at the Tricycle Theatre uh, premiering my solo show, A Boy and a Soul, there. And that was my entryway into uh, the London theater scene and it's been exciting and thrilling and London audiences have been great and they've been very open and welcoming uh, to this um, silly old American and <laughs> yeah but we, we've been having a good time I feel like we've been um, really getting to know each other and I think that uh, now I'm really excited for them to uh, for London theater going audiences to experience something like the Scottsboro Boys which is very dear to my heart and, and very passionate and it's um, um, I think one of the most daring musicals um, out there. And tell us a little bit about the Scottsboro Boys and of course your role in it as well. Uh, the Scottsboro Boys is a, uh, a musical written by the legend legendary team of Candor and Ebb and uh, it's directed by Five Time Tony Award winner Susan Stroman and uh, it is about uh, 1931 nine African-American teenage boys were accused of a horrible crime and um, and, and they, they were unjustly accused of this crime, and it basically destroyed their lives. And the way that we examine and tell the story is with a daring, evocative uh, musical style, um, and in a defunct mu musical style, but we take elements of it to tell the story. We, um, it's, it's the clashing of a racially charged incident with a racially charged uh, uh, form of theatrical entertainment that was popular for a, a, over 100 years. So we use a deconstructed some bits and pieces of the menstrual form mm -hmm. to tell the story. And a lot of people may not be familiar exactly what the menstrual form is, but we take elements of it. There's certain um, standards that are in it. We don't use everything, but we use what we need to tell, mm -hmm. tell the story. So, and I, I play Mr. Bones. Mr. Bones and the standard menstrual show was um, uh, one of the two end men, uh, sort of the, um, like there's the interlocutor who's sort of the master of ceremonies and then there are the two end men that help forward the stories. Uh, every so often the interlocutor would say, oh, you know, Mr. Bones, flavor us with a story. And I would tell a story that would help keeping the, the momentum of the evening going, yeah. So I play Mr. Bones and Mr. Bones in this play, I play a lot of really dastardly, uh, racially biased uh, Caucasian men in the South in, 19, in the 1930s, whether I play a, a district attorney, I, uh, I play, you know, um, prosecutors, I play, you name it, guards, sheriffs, etc. Yeah. Gosh, that's a lot of roles then, yeah, isn't yeah, it? How, yeah. do you, how do you cope with all of that? You know, you, 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 you go big and bold and strong with the, your characterizations of people. Um, it is a way that we get to see the absurdity of racism in many ways. So I think sometimes we we paint in broad strokes, even physically, what I what I do in the show. Um, but so we can also see the absurdity um, when it comes to um, the inhumanity and injustice of of, of, of humankind. Mm. Yeah. How much did you know about the real life Scottsboro Boys before this musical by Candor and You know, unfortunately, I did not know about the Scottsboro Boys. It's it. I think there's a lot of you know, especially when it comes to American history in our schools, there's a lot of shame mm -hmm. attached to a lot of the history of America and a lot of things that are very uncomfortable. And I think that uh, we try to sweep it under the rug a bit. Um, growing up in schools, uh, and I went to public schools growing up, I knew about, you know, you know about slavery and then Martin Luther King and then where are we today? But all the stuff in between mm -hmm. um, sort of gets um, generalized in a way. So I didn't find out about the Scottsboro Boys case I found I heard a little bit about it in an African American studies class once in college, but I didn't really go in depth with the Scottsboro Boys until I was actually handed this script, and I was like, "What is the Scottsboro Boys? I've heard of it, but I didn't know exactly what it was." And so then I started to research and find out more, and then I got a little angry because I was like, "Why don't I know this? Why, why don't we all know this as, as a culture?" And this is the way that we're able to examine and discuss and move forward when it comes to such um, uh, racially charged. Uh, feelings in the United States that are still prevalent. You know, anytime a, a case like the Trayvon Martin case comes up, and also it's, like, it's not a surprise that we're feeling these things. You know, that any, everyone as a country we're feeling these things because we're not talking about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, and it's not, and it's the responsibility. And I think the beautiful responsibility that we have in the theater is that we can actually engage in this conversation in art. Mm -hmm. And then we can walk out and actually think, you know, challenge ourselves to think differently. 
you know? So I think that's powerful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you mentioned the word um, responsibility there, and I guess with, with bringing something like this to life, with bringing a true story to life, there's even more responsibility in a way, isn't there? Absolutely. There's absolute responsibility in the telling of this tale. I think that uh, uh, the creative team, uh, all the artists, all the, the actors, the designers, everyone, they're very sensitive when it comes to we want to get it right. We want to tell the story and be as honest as possible mm -hmm. and not put anything else on it but let the truth speak for itself. So it is a responsibility and that these were real men, these were real, um, the Nine Scusper boys were real young men and the people that I'm playing were all very real as well. And it's important for me, for me to play these uh, racially charged human beings, um, to play them with, it, to look at their humanity or inhumanity and to look at, and look at something and bring it close to myself because something Anything human does, human is, right? And so it's a really great examination for me as well, for me to um, to be, be responsible, to hold the responsibility of finding out what fears that these men have or why did they feel the way they felt to do and to justify these actions. You know what I mean? So in a way, I think, which is a beautiful thing that we get to do as artists, I get to actually, even if I played a role like Hitler, the idea to find out what was Hitler's heart about what, what, what was in his mind, in his heart, in his spirit, you know what I mean? And to like play him by not judging him, but letting him speak for himself. Mm. You know, I think it's very interesting in that it's way. Really, it's an interesting, it certainly is an interesting profession where you get to play all these kind of very different parts, isn't yeah. it? You know, and examine other people's lives and perspectives, yeah. no matter what they are. I mean, of course, we said it's a Candor and Ebb musical, and they're fantastic. I love Chicago and, and Cabaret, and I heard the songs from this show, and they're, they're fantastic too. I mean, you yourself, it's your second Candor and Ebb show, yes, isn't it? it? You're Billy Flynn in Chicago. Yes, so how does it compare, the, um, the Scotch River Boys experience? I think that the, the idea of... Um, Kander and Epp, what they do so well, um, and what John Kander continues to do, as, as Fred, Fred Epp has passed away years mm -hmm. ago, I think they continue to tell stories. Um, Susan Stroman has said this many times. They tell stories of ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. Um, they're real, true storytellers. It's not just about a little ditty and you tapping your feet. They're really good about getting a hook in the music musicality of telling a story, but. Bottom line, um, it's the essence, it's so detailed, it's so character driven, it has a lot of um, weight to it. And it also has a little a wit and fun, and the music is always a little sexy at times. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think you look at Kendra and Ev, they, 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 they understand human, all the different frailties and, and um, interesting things about humankind and human nature. You know, I think like you think about Roxy, you think you think about Ro <laughs> you know you think about Roxy, you think about you know Kisses of the Spider Woman. They're such interestingly drawn characters, and they know how to really help them tell a story with music. And I, I'm I'm beyond de delighted. And um, the funny thing is, I did Scottsboro Boys first, and then I did Chicago, and then I went back to Scottsboro Boys. So the idea for my first um, foray in, with uh, Kendra Neb was with their final musical co collaboration. Um, Scottsboro Boys, I think is so, um, I feel so honored and it feels so important because I do feel like this is one for the history books. And you originated the role of Mr. Bones, didn't you, on Off-Broadway and then on Broadway yeah. and now bringing it to London. Yeah. How do you think the London experience will compare? I think the London experience will compare in a really um, fantastic way because I think that London theatre audiences don't have the baggage that we have as Americans about this subject. So there's a bit more... Um, a little bit more distance, and so with that distance, you can actually um, be open a, a bit more open to the conventions that we're setting up, and to the story mm -hmm. because you're looking at it as a story instead of looking at something like, oh, this is what happened here to us, and to you know, and this is our yeah. So it's a different conversation, I think, and I think um, from what I've been um, getting, um, I love, I've been, I really love a, a London theater going audience. They don't. You know, they don't, they're like New Yorkers in a way. New Yorkers may sit with their arms folded and then they, and then they open up eventually. Um, London audiences, I notice they'll sit and they're very quiet, they're very attentive, their hands are here and they're waiting and they're waiting <laughs> and, they're wait, and they're like, oh, you're gonna tell us a story? We're with you. And they may not be as responsive, you know, as we are as, you know, as an American theater going audience, but they respond with their applause at the end and you know or rising to their feet mm -hmm. and uh, because they're real, they're a listening audience so i think i'm excited about that fantastic yeah. and of course working with um susan stroman again you mentioned her already um director choreographer tony award-winning director choreographer what's that like 
It's, it's, she really has, she's the best of the best, truly, and I, and I really mean that. She's um, the most kind and uh, generous um, director. She, you know, she knows every detail of what she wants, but she's also very open to what you bring to it. She'll just say to uh, Forrest McClendon and I, you know, who plays Mr. Tambo, she would just say, okay, what have you got for me today? And so we would, cut, we would be challenged to go home and we'd come up with five different choices. You know, we're like, oh, well, let's try this, we'll try this. And she will shape it, you know, leaning towards what, the way it fits in the play. But she's very open with you to, to bring what you bring. And so, um, and that's every single person. That's John Cander, that's Tommy Thompson, the book writer. Everyone has that generosity, and I think that's what shows up on that stage. Um, they, set, they, they set the bar that high where they really um, want you to invest as everything you can. So you go home, you take care of yourself, you, you're, you're on time, you, are, you keep yourself healthy, you keep yourself well-read and well-versed on, on what you're doing, and um, you come into the room and you, and you bring all of it. And so they, they set the room up in that way. So Susan Stroman truly is the best, and I, I have so much respect for her. And look at her, she's working, she's on like four shows right now, like, you know, two shows on Broadway and all these things. She's everywhere, which is awesome, and, but, and, but, and, but she manages very well, which is great, yeah. Now, there was talk a few years back of maybe somebody like Lee Daniels um, taking uh, the Scottsboro Boys onto the big screen. Of course, Lee Daniels, you know, for films like Precious and most recently The Butler as well, which you, which you were in. Um, what do you think of that? Would you like to see it transfer to the big screen? I would absolutely like it to transfer to the big screen. I think that, um, I know that Lee is very interested in doing it as well. Um, I think we had a conversation about exactly what is the best way to tell it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in the film medium, and I think th those are the questions that are that are circling. I think this would be such an impactful film. Um, I actually even thought of dancing with the, you know, the thought of like, you know, what? Because I'm also a playwright, and I thought, well, I think I can figure out. <laughs> the, the screenplay for this, so who knows? You know, you know. I talked to Tommy Thompson about it. It's like, well, maybe we can figure this out where it's a, where it is a bit more um, theatrical mixed in with the film. I, I think that can be interesting. I think that we, I feel like that this would be such a brilliant film, but it really does need all the essence, sort of like the way Chicago was transformed, yeah. you know, tra transformed uh, into film. I think I want, you want to keep the cadences of theater. You know, I think that's very important. And I think there's a new way to tell this story. Um, and I think it'll be dazzling yeah. with film, yeah. That's fantastic, definitely, and he's a great director as well, isn't he? You mentioned um, The Butler there, of course, which you are in. Yes, um, yes. Tell us about your role in the film and, and, and who you were working with on oh, set. Oh my gosh, I'm in this film called The Butler, and it's directed <laughs> by Lee Daniels, and um, I play the head of the White House Butler staff. And my staff includes um, the star of the film, Forrest uh, Whitaker, and his wife is Oprah Winfrey. And then we have uh, such a crackerjack group of artists, um, other people who are my staff, um, who I, they work for me, like <laughs> Lenny Kravitz and Cuba Gooding Jr., and Pernell Walker. And then we have a host of people who play presidents, you name it, uh, from Robin Williams to Lee F. Shriver to um, Jane Fonda, uh, Mariah Carey, to, I mean, you, it, it's really like the cast of all casts. And it's been the number one movie in America for at least, it was on number one for about three weeks. And it's doing so well at the box office. And it's one of the most, I think it really is an important film. And I feel it's, um, it is a film like the Scottsboro Boys in a way. And like this play where it has such an important message. And it's about, once again, it's a film about bringing um, the conscious of America together, I think. You know what I mean? Yes. I think for um, it really is a movie, movie about bringing us forward and beginning that conversation again and knowing our history, knowing our collective history as Americans. It's not just just because the film centered on a White House butler, um, this African American butler. That's all of our stories. You know what I mean? So you know, I think it's a really a way to bring us together. Looking at um, this or once again, this ordinary man. Mm -hmm in an extraordinary situation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, what was the most memorable part of filming for you? The most memorable part, we, we shot in New Orleans for two weeks, two months, um, two months. And I think the most memorable parts for me were um, spending time off screen with the cast. We, we became very close, like a theater company, where we would go and watch jazz together and go to brunch together. and. We will always make sure we're just very aware, you know, on our day off, we would spend time together. We would go to Lee Daniels' house and we would 
be in the pool and then other people will come by who were doing films down there like Denzel Washington or you, you name it. You know, we were staying at Sandra, he was staying at Sandra Bullock's house. It was just also, it was like Hollywood South, but also it was, it was, it took the, the edge of Hollywood was not on it. It was more just about being here in this small town mm -hmm doing our work as artists. And so that was the most oh, special time. That was Absolutely. it, yeah. And what's Lee Daniels like to work with? Lee Daniels is a dream director. He really is, um, he's become a dear friend and um, he's someone who, um, who fascinates me. I think he's a very, he's got a very strong mind and he really um, tries to elevate everything that you're, you're doing. He, he, ch he pushes and challenges everyone. I mean, if you think you're gonna come in and do what you've done before, you're absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. he, will, he will challenge you to say, no, to strip away any artifice and get down to the truth. He really wants the honest truth. And if you're putting on something, he, he can smell it and see it. He demanded no makeup on anyone. It just, it just really as natural as possible, a performance. And that's something that I'm, I'm very interested in because uh, it's a challenge in a way, you know, to just to just be as honest mm -hmm. on camera with the camera that close on you, and to be that raw. And so I think he's a, a dream director, and he's um, I, I admire him as well greatly. And you mentioned Oprah Winfrey as well, of mm -hmm. course, in the film, and um, you've in the Big Gay Sketch Show you did an impression to Oprah Winfrey, didn't you? So what was that like in a I film did, with her when I you've did, done that? I did. <laughs> it's funny because I was like, I was like, oh my gosh. Lee called me one day. He says, oh my gosh, my attorney. Um, he said he he turned me on to this. I didn't know you played Oprah before. I said, I said, oh my God, I did. But then we did these some crazy sketches. I said, please, I hope she never sees them. I said, but I think that she would laugh because I think she's got a good sense of humor about it all. Yeah. And so it was nice, you know, the idea of playing, you know, you know. And I try to play every any celebrity that I played. I played like. RuPaul and mm. Tyra Banks and, and Beyonce, Beyonce. I played Morgan Freeman and each time I just went to approach them with love of like what is it about them that is very interesting to me so I love that I love that <laughs> the fact that I've, I've been able to play these people and uh, then the idea of being in a room with her and she uh, at the premiere of The Butler it was so sweet she turned around and she saw me and she said she opens her arms up as the way you've seen her do it mm. on her show many times and you're like oh my god <laughs> Coleman you were wonderful and I was like oh my gosh and she's now saying that to me how wonderful and uh, so she's a really kind woman very very kind and I, I think a really beautiful beautiful actress and um and you know, sometimes people try to limit what we all do, and you know, think she, she's this brand and this, you know. But she really is such a kind, kind, generous um, woman, and very inspiring. Even just the energy of just being in a room with her. Um, the first time I met her, we shook hands, and she held my hand a little longer to just really, you know, it, it wasn't just a shaking of a hand. It's like, oh no, we're really getting to know each other, and that's important to her. Mm -hmm. And I see that's why her. I think that's why her influence is so large, and. Um, why she does what she's doing, she's been able to have that much influence around the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you've got so many other things as well coming up film-wise. Tell us a little bit about what else we can expect to see you in on the big screen. You can see me in a few things. Let's <laughs> see. There's a film called Newlyweeds that just opened last weekend, and it's about a, um, a couple that has a love for something that's in the title of Newlyweeds. And I play this um, really out of control um, arts arts. Um, art curator mm -hmm. who uh, who sort of gets in the middle of this relationship and pl I play a really out of control silly guy. Mm -hmm. He's really silly. And he's also um, a lover of that, th something about title. And uh, <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and then I have a film coming out called All Is Bright that comes out mm -hmm. next next month uh, starring Paul Giamatti and Paul Rudd and Sally Hawkins. And um, yeah, that was when I played this character named Inzomo who's a really sweet South African guy who just works with Paul the Pauls. He works with those guys at their Christmas tree stand in New York City. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, so I have that going on, and yeah, so I've, those three films are, are out right now. And The Butler, you can still catch up, check The Butler out in the States. I mean, what's it like working with Paul Rudd and uh, Paul G. Massey as well? So much fun. When I say so much fun, you feel so relaxed because they're masters at what they do. Paul Rudd, you never know what he's going to do from take to take. Really? One take, he kissed me full on the lips. And, it's just, <laughs> and I, was, I was like, Paul, you realize you just gave me my first screen kiss. <laughs> He was like, really? That's so funny. And so he's, he's got a great sense of humor. Uh, Paul Giamatti is really, from take to take, he just goes deeper and deeper. And he's just open and available. I really love those guys. And, and Sally Hawkins, oh, oh, yeah, she's fabulous. I fell in love with her. I fell in love. We had some, just some sweet scenes, you know. It's like we're, we all play these very um, sort of, I don't know, 
dysfunctional, lonely people in a way. And we get together one night, I think it's Christmas Eve, and we're, it's, we're dancing and singing and being out of control, and it's really sweet to see this foursome together. You know, it's really sweet, yeah. And oh. I love Sally, yeah. I can't wait to see it, it sounds yeah. fantastic. <laughs> and there's also, is there something called 400 Boys as well? Yes, 400 Boys. 400 Boys is a film that I am supposed to shoot. It was supposed to shoot in China. Um, months ago, mm. and it's been put off and put off a bit. You know, it's a huge production with huge uh, production values and things. And so I think it's been a lot of issues. We're just trying to get it done. But hopefully, we'll be we'll start shooting at some point. Hopefully, we'll start shooting. Maybe timing will work out well, and we'll start shooting right after I'm done here at the Young Vic. And that's an action as well. I think it's yeah, it? that's an action film. And I, I play I, I would play a character named Talon, who is um, sort of an, a very um, I play a killer. Basically, I play a killer. <laughs> Basically, he's a killer in this. Yeah, yeah. So I get to get, I get to play some good guys and I get to play some really bad guys. It's good to play a variety of people, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it do you do stunts and stuff? And will you have stunts? You think coming up in this one? I would have stunts in this. Yeah, I would have stunts in this. So I'm ready for that sort of work. I, I don't, I don't mind. Um, I'm ready to do something like Star Wars, or I feel like I'll, I'll be interested in doing some sci-fi because I do a lot of very. I've been doing a lot of period dramas mm -hmm. or and uh, now I'm doing some more contemporary it's a, it's funny like newlyweeds and newlyweeds in particular is like the first one we actually see me dressed m more similar to the way I do in my real life yeah you know it's the most contemporary that I've been and I'm like oh my gosh I'm not in like you know I was in Lincoln and I was in you know yeah. you know the thing, the thing you know civil war uniform you know it's like you know oh, oh my gosh I actually play a contemporary character you know so that's kind of nice so hopefully I play a bit more contemporary and now I like to take it up and do some maybe go further and go more like yeah, sci-fi cool, yeah definitely and you, you mentioned series. yeah you mentioned Star Wars as well and of course J.J. Abrams you've got episode 7 coming out we've heard filming now is going to start in January is that yeah. the kind of thing if you if if he gave you a call, Coleman, come and be in Star Wars episode seven or eight or nine, what would you say and who would you like to be? I would say I'm available and I will be anyone that you want me to be <laughs> because I'm just available for that film. Okay? <laughs> Is that a cheap plug? Is that cheap? <laughs> exactly. Am I selling myself? You can go to ColemanDomingo.com to find out more about me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I hope he takes you up on I mean, your what offer. If, what if we, you just made it happen <laughs> for me? That would be fantastic. It would be amazing. I have to give you 10%. Well, I'll give you yeah. some. I'll give you some. Money. I'll take you to dinner at least. <laughs> you're too good. You're too good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, is sci-fi something you're interested in terms of it's something that you watch as well? or? I don't really watch a lot of sci-fi. I've just been more intrigued by it because, I, I, like I said, I've always been doing these this very naturalistic, mm. realistic things. And I'm interested in, like, the fantasy world. Like, mm. what is that? I'm trying to grow into something else. Yeah. You know what I mean? Also, I'm a very physical person as well. And so I think the idea of like, you know, every time I see something like a Crouch and Tiger and Hidden Dragon mm -hmm. or something, I'm like, wow, I would be interested in doing that. Um, I'm always interested in doing something that I've never done before. And I would be interested in doing my own stunts too, because I'm very um, fit in that way. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. And another thing, of course, as well, you're thinking about that kind of fantasy world in a way, is there's so um, much love now for comic book movies as well, yeah. adaptations, whether it be things like the Avengers or Thor and yeah. stuff like that, and all the DC world of Superman and yes. Batman. We've just had Ben Affleck recently has uh, been yeah. going to be the new Batman. I mean, is that something you'd be interested in as well? I mean, are you into the kind of comic books when you were a kid? As Absolutely. I, I used to collect the comic books like Fantastic Four and things mm -hmm. like that. And I would really, that, I think something about that is so interesting, the idea of playing um, a superhuman, a superhero, and something that is like, you know, you have to, you, your brain has to go a little further in, as an audience member. And, you know, you already do that with a comic book. Mm -hmm. The idea of comic books come to, come to life, I think it's really awesome. It's funny because I was actually thinking that one of my, my scripts, because I'm also a playwright, one of my scripts, A Boy and a Soul, I thought, I actually want to do a comic book of that. Oh, that would be very interesting. Okay. A comic book, and then it has and have, has a music component to it as well. But it, there's new ways to tell stories. You know what I mean? And especially with like, you know, in, the, in our digital age, I'm like, yeah, we can go really far in the way we tell tell stories, and we can really go far in our imagination. So I'm really interested in that. Definitely. You know. I mean, if you could be anyone in that kind of superhero comic book world, who would you like to be? <sighs> what would I be? I guess it would be like, I feel like, only because I've always been a fan. I mean, I would love to be Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's such a classic. I know it sounds like a classic. I love Spider-Man. You know, I'm like, I'm like, I'm a Spider-Man type. You know, I love the idea of playing. You know, this this nerdy guy, and then he's, you know, he's superhuman. You know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, you know, and the skills are just awesome. It's just like you're just flying and twirling. Yeah. I, mean, I went and saw Spider-Man on Broadway. And at first I went in there just like, oh, that's going to be a bunch of crap or whatever. I was like, I need to be in this 
<laughs> and I've never done a musical like that. And I really thought, I've got to be in this. This is incredible. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, it's, just, it's awesome. I just think it's awesome, you know? Yeah, so we'll see. Yeah, well, there's loads of loads of like, great things out there and great opportunities. So we hope you're going to get offered many, many more of them. And I've just got to ask you, because you mentioned, um, we talked a little bit about stunts and how you're physical and stuff, and you'd like to do that sort of thing. And obviously in the Scots for Boys, you do a lot of dancing, although you're not a trained dancer. So how have you found that? I've, I find it very interesting. Once again, it's like, I mean, when I, in the beginning of my career, I was um, in a circus company. And I was trained with all these master, uh, Chinese masters. Um, Master Lu Yi in particular taught me how to um, I became an aerial web artist. Wow. I, I learned to... Real life Spider-Man. Yeah, totally, exactly. You know, yeah, it's real life Spider-Man. And I learned to walk on five feet tall stilts and juggle and, you know, juggle, you know, pins, you know, five pins. And so I still have these skills. But once again, I've always been that kind of person which like, what I don't know, I'm game for it. And I'll learn how to do it. Um, if it's an exciting challenge and it's exciting to see what your body can do and, um, uh, your, your agility. And I think I'm just excited about that. Something about like, how far can I push my body, you know, to, to do something really interesting and, and create a daring feat. I have a friend, a dear friend, who, um, who's in that show Limbo. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, exactly. He's, um, he's the contortionist, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan knows him. And I watch him work, and I'm like, it's amazing what a body can do. Yeah. And it's breathtaking to see that. And it's all just with training and, and saying yes and being daring. And so I'm really excited about that kind of stuff. Brilliant. And finally, why should people come and see the Scottsboro Boys when it opens on the 18th of October? People should come and see the Scottsboro Boys because it really is one of the most daring musicals that they'll ever see in their lifetime. I, I, I can honestly say that. This is a show that I, I, I watch audience members um, all at one time. It could be one event happening on stage and there's someone horrified, there's someone laughing, there's someone weeping, um, there's someone applauding. It's really touching people on many different levels. And as, um, as an audience, it's really thrilling to see that conversation happening. I think the play is shattering in, in its uh, telling of this tale. Um, it's exciting. It's um, watching all these young men, this cast, they're out of control. They do everything. They look like they can do anything. Mm -hmm. They look superhuman. They sing, they dance, they act, they flip, they, they do everything. They build the set, they deconstruct the set. We play everything. They play the women, they play the men, they play the, um, the preachers, they play the guards. We, we play everything. So I think it, it, does, it is a daring feat of theatricality that um, I would challenge that anyone has seen in a long time. Well, we can't wait to see it. Absolutely can't. And um, good luck with the rest of rehearsals. Thank it's been you. lovely talking to you, Thanks. Carmen. It's so great talking to you, too. You're so wonderful. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you.